Good morning and welcome to the Ask Weldon Show, episode 206. Today we're going to talk about what conversations do players and teams have after losing worlds? That's the main question of the show. We have two others to follow up. Uh, this is the Ask Weldon Show. I am Weldon. Uh, I have a master's degree in master's of sport science degree in sport and exercise psychology, and I've been coaching and training in professional esports for a number of years. And on this show, people call in questions to me. You can call in your own question, anchor.fm slash Weldon Green. Usually people limit these questions to performance, high performance elites, performance in esport coaching and League of Legends as well, which is kind of like a game that I specialize in a little bit. But... People ask about relationships, people ask about business, people ask about business performance, um, you know, school, stuff like that as well. So literally just call in whatever is kind of on the top of your head and we will see about answering it in whatever way that I can, whether through life experience or I'll just say, I don't know, or, uh, you know, we'll dig into it and see, see what I have to offer you. No other announcements. MSI is underway. I feel like Christmas is here early uh, after a, after a break of League of Legends content. There's actually stuff happening on the subreddit. There's stuff happening on Twitch. There's content to watch. There's games to watch. There's people to talk about. There's results, and uh, they're kind of as expected in a way. So um, if you haven't checked out MSI yet, the first day of games has been very spectacular and fun to watch. And there's a whole bunch of content creators that are now coming out of the woodwork. Travis has new interviews. Kelsey is talking about stuff. Um, I'm sure there's more interviews to come in the days to follow. And uh, yeah, very excited about that. Summer's here. It's really freaking hot in Finland, as you can see. I usually wear the shirt that I wore the night before, the morning for the shoot, um, so that you know I have this like kind of continuation from my Snapchat story into what is happening in the evening in North America, which is this show. Uh, and obviously this is, this is what the temperature was yesterday and it's actually pretty warm this morning here in front of all these lights. So yeah, very excited about that. Very excited about that. Finland, for those of you who don't know, is uh, pretty cold most of the time and dark and cold and dark, but summer's here. The world is alive. All right, let's jump into the show. We're just going to jump right into it, guys. The first question from Pepe. Yes. I don't know which one. Don't ask me. But uh, it's it's the uh, the banger about uh, what, what players talk about at Worlds. What are the conversations that a professional team has after going to Worlds and not doing as well as they would like? Obviously, there's only one winner. So what is the process after losing at such an event? What are some of the ways you've seen some players deal with the loss? All right, so I'm going to answer this two ways. I'm going to answer this the ways that players do and the way that players should cope with this. So there's there's essentially um, a part, there's, there's a way of doing these international tournaments where you try to protect yourself and your psyche from damage. And the way that you do that is you make excuses beforehand. You, you tell yourself, you know, why it's okay if you end up losing. You tell yourself you tried hard. You tell yourself, um, you know, like, Oh, we're not the favorites. You tell yourself all this stuff beforehand in order to like cushion your mind and your emotions so that afterwards you don't hurt as much. Um, and then there's the appropriate high performance way to handle these major tournaments, which is to which is to be able to cope with performance pressure, layer on the pressure, and use the pressure and the excitement and the and the expectations to power you and fuel you. Um and to always focus on just the performance act and not worry about the results as you're going along. And then when the day comes that you lose, you begin to grieve. Now, the brain handles grief and like like somebody died grief and losing with the same circuitry. It's in a very efficient it's a very efficient organ. It tries to reuse as much stuff as possible. So when we invented sport and we were like, okay, now we're losing these things. The brain was like, oh, losing. Okay, I know about that. Yeah, that's when your like, sister dies, right? Um, and so it just starts using that stuff. So if you've ever seen people sobbing hysterically on stage, uh, like, for example, Luca last year in China yeah, at the end of Worlds, this is the grieving process that he would go through if he lost somebody important to him at a much less level of intensity, obviously, than, than death, but uh, still 
very similar. So you, people go through the grieving process, which is uh, what is the, what are the steps of grief? Steps of grief. Um, five stages of grief by Elizabeth Kubler Ross and David Kessler. Oh come on, I don't want to load a freaking web page. Give me a, an image. Uh, here we go. A shock. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, testing, acceptance. Okay, so you basically go through that. So first you see people in shock, in denial, anger, bargaining, depression, testing, acceptance. And, and and those are the like the mental ones. Of course, then there's just like complete emotional breakdowns that happen within there too as well. So um, what do players talk about? Well, I I try to make sure that uh, that they talk about... I I've had some one-on-ones after Worlds. I had more with G2 than I did with TSM. Uh, and I regretted that I wasn't able to meet with a lot of the TSM guys one-on-one. Um, it it kind of like everybody's ships get shipped out the next day when you lose a tournament. Like Riot doesn't really want to pay for hotel rooms. So everybody leaves like the next morning. And, um, and then like I basically left from there straight back to Finland after Lost Worlds. So I didn't get a chance to meet them back at the house we didn't really get a chance to debrief as a team or anything. So with G2, I wanted to make sure that that was going to happen, right? So, uh, you know, we had debriefings, we had a team debriefing, we talked, and I made sure to frame the narrative of what they had just undergone in a very, like, take it forward kind of way. So the players individually are thinking things like, they're trying to figure out why, mostly. They're trying to figure out why. And they're trying to tell their own story of why. And um, that's just what the brain does, you know, to protect itself. So mostly they're just bargaining with their emotions and their self-talk to figure out, uh, to figure out how to survive through the grief. And that's what you should do. And it's fine as long as the reasons that you come up with are true, right? As long as they're not excuses, as long as they're things like the other team was better and not... Uh, you know, oh, I had a fly in my soup the night before, and whatever, that kind of stuff. And mostly, they come up with appropriate stuff, you know? I tell them, like, the reason you lose a game is because the other team is better, period. And TSM went to Worlds, and the other team was better. And the fans are all like, blah, 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 this, and blah, 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 that, and blah, 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 whatever. Um, but the players just know that the other team was better, and that they have to... Uh, have to try harder next tournament as far as like depth of tournament like the fans are all really obsessed with like how deep you go in a tournament no player cares about that no real competitor gives a crap about depth of tournament in a single elimination tournament unless you get to the finals i promise i swear to god because aside from the paycheck and the fact that like reddit gets off your back for some reason if you go deeper in tournament because in a single elimination tournament the Those tournaments are very good at determining who the best team is. And they're very bad at ranking the strength of teams otherwise. That's not what they're for. They're they're constructed in order to determine the best team. And uh, and that is is what they do. And they do not otherwise rank or hierarchy teams in any way. um, Because you can have, like, you know, strength of schedule, right? You can have, like, the top two teams in your group and have the hardest group of the tournament. Or you can have... The, the 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 worst three teams technically in your group and you can have like you know a very easy path and get all the way to semis without actually facing anybody who's who's you know actually good uh and so the these kind of single elimination tournaments are uh, season a season is what ranks teams right a season of games and and tournaments uh, sorry matches that is what is really good at ranking team strength over time so so players typically don't give a crap if they you know happen to get to quarters or not um usually the people i talk to they have the same frustration whether they go out in groups or go out in quarters or go out in semis um finals is really the only thing that matters because it because uh once you get there it kind of like shows that you're one of the top two teams in a way maybe you're top four if you have a bizarre schedule but it's like the most hierarchical the tournament can get in terms of determining strength uh, is that one team is the best and one team is at least top four Um, the second strongest team might have gone out in the semis to the finalist for example so 
Yeah, so that's that's kind of how it works. So what do they talk about? They talk about... Um, they don't talk about anything. <laughs> they only talk to me. They rarely talk to each other. That's why with G2, I put the team together and we we made them make up and and have a meal together and talk deep into the night because it was probably going to be the last time that they were all together, right? Because G2 broke up shortly thereafter. And, uh, and it was important for, to me that the relationships that they established there continued because what happens when you have these deep brotherhood forming experiences of a season or a year together living in the same house and training, then you go to these tournaments, you know, and have these like intense emotional things. People get embarrassed by that and they won't talk to each other again because they don't want to relive those lives. Uh, and then those relationships kind of like fall by the wayside, even though you have an opportunity to cultivate them. So uh, I I kind of like forced G2 to think about cultivating them. And I'm happy to say that it's been successful. Like Luca has put in a ton of effort to to maintain and establish establish and maintain his relationships with his teammates as they've gone on to other teams. And I think that he's incredibly mature and smart in that way to kind of like continue that. And I really like to see it. Okay. So that was kind of a meandering tell all of some of my experiences after worlds with what people talk about. Let's go into question number two. Hello, well done. I always had a bad sleep schedule, like I would go to sleep at 1 or 2 a.m. and wake up at around 7 if I had the university at 8, or if not, I would wake up at 10 a.m. But uh, from like a week or so, I tried to go to sleep earlier, like 12 or 11.30, and try to wake up around 8. But I realized that a lot of the times my body wakes up like 40 minutes or one hour earlier than I wanted to. Like I want to sleep a full eight hours and it would just wake up at seven hours. But from the past I've seen that uh, eight hours is the best uh, sleep mark for me. And if I sleep eight hours I feel the best. Should I try to go to sleep earlier and maybe this way my body will still wake up at the same hour but it will be eight hours of sleep? Or try not to force it at all and keep a seven hour margin. All right. Thank you for this question. The answer is that you should probably go to bed earlier. So the body, like, you should not pay attention too much on the short term. I mean, like in a week or like in a couple days or like, you know, over, over the course of one or two weeks to how much sleep your body, like when your body wakes up, because there's a number of different things that affect that besides how much sleep you need. Okay. If you're getting like okay-ish sleep, then there's other things that can wake your body up that'll really screw you over. There's things like light. Um, there's things like the regular circadian rhythm of your body. It is difficult to move your circadian rhythm. Okay. So you have to like adjust it over the course of weeks to move your circadian rhythm even like an hour because it's so like hormonally constant based on the light in your day. Okay. So it's really difficult for you to say like, essentially you don't wake up when you like, you wake up and your circadian rhythm tells you that it's time to wake up. You don't wake up based on like how much number of hours of body, like your body doesn't have a clock. Okay. It has a circadian rhythm. So you have a low point of your temperature and then you wake up as that temperature is rising. And as light is hitting your eyelids, period. Um, Unless you're super tired, in which case you force your body to sleep longer just by exhausting it, which is what you were doing before when you were like staying up too late and being super exhausted and then somehow sleeping a full eight hours um, in the morning just because you, you were like torturing your body to the point where it needed sleep more than it was obeying its hormones. So what you need to do is you need to go to sleep earlier because you're, or you need to shift, somehow shift your circadian rhythm. But that's very difficult unless you have like really con- close control over your environment in terms of blackout curtains and you wear the eye masks and stuff like that. And like the first light that you see in the day period is like, you know, when was your times like eight thirty, you know, or something like that or eight after you wake up, which is not likely because you probably have light leaking in around the edges of your, of your screen or in your windows and stuff like that. So also I think that there's some evidence coming out showing that, that sleep before midnight is qualitatively different than sleep after midnight, that you should be going to bed earlier than, that humans should be going to bed earlier than they are nowadays, that you should be going to bed at like 10 or 9. Uh, so I would recommend like, I would recommend going to bed earlier. 
very strongly and seeing if you can sleep. And if you get up earlier, then, I mean, do whatever you were going to do it, you know, from 10 to midnight, do it in the morning. Then you will know the answer of like how long your body needs to sleep if you get to bed at 9 or 10. Then you will know the answer of how long you need to sleep. And at first, at first, trust me, you're only going to sleep like six or seven hours. You're going to wake up super early. But like don't accept that in a way. Like just kind of like keep going to bed early and sleeping and eventually your body will like de-stress a little bit and you'll be able to sleep the amount that you should instead of the amount that you've programmed yourself to uh, by by sleeping that amount previously. Okay, that's the second question. Last question comes from Jeff and it is related to Team Fortress, which uh, is kind of funny. In the last week, I haven't heard about this game for years. Uh, I think about it because it was a fun game and I used to play it with my wife, but I haven't heard about it in years and then this week, like two people have mentioned it to me. So before I go into that question, I want to recommend the Mac program. This is my training program that I have as an online video training program. So uh, it's it's like 47 videos online, seven modules, seven days. Each video has a lecture and then a mindfulness training session. And it is, uh, it is the training program that I use to try to reach all of you guys. So I have a number of requests for training, like, hey, can you train me? Hey, can you train me? And the answer is usually no, because I'm too busy. Uh, sometimes it's yes, but it costs this amount of money. And then people are like, oh, never mind. Um, so this is how you can get training from me in video format. And this is essentially the exact same thing that I cover with athletes. It's just that you kind of have to do the work. So normally athletes talk and I do the work and I take notes and I find the teachable moments and I construct it in their lives for them and and they have a tailored plan, right? Well, in this one, you have to kind of understand the concepts and figure them out from my lectures and then, you know, apply them to your life and you have to do the homework in that way. And so, uh, but if you're willing to, and if you're at that point and you're like, I'm ready and, I, and I've got the motivation and I'm going to take action, then this is a very suitable kind of program for you. And it's, it won't be that different from doing one-on-one sessions. Um, but if you're like, if you like need the construction and you need the motivation, you need somebody else to kind of do it. If you're at that phase in your development or your like behavior change, then maybe it's not so suitable. You should use the code Ask Weldon to get a discount and to say that, hey, I come from YouTube. Uh, when you check it out, mindgames.gg slash M-A-C. Okay, last question of the day. Hey, Weldon. I'm part of a small competitive community in a game called Team Fortress 2, which is pretty much only active at night. I find that after a long day of school and more study in the afternoon, followed by a session of exercise, that it's very hard to have the energy and focus to practice deliberately. So how should I go about tackling this? Thanks. All right. So unfortunately, my first instinct is like, maybe you should not be part of this community. Uh, But I don't want to tell you to give up on your dreams. And um, so let's talk about like practical solutions. You need sleep. Sounds like you're not necessarily getting enough sleep. And it sounds like you're really tired at the end of a day to, to train and to focus because you've already kind of used all of your stuff, all of your resources, mental, emotional, physical, and, uh, and, and so essentially when you burn down a candle and then at the end of the day, you want, you want some light, uh, and you've been burning it all day. It's really hard to, to start it back on fire when it's this little stub, you know, at the bottom, there's not very much left. The, the solution for that is to not do that and sleep instead. There's, there's really no other way to go about it. Like it sounds like you're doing the important stuff. So how can you, but how can you hack it? I really can't think of a healthy way to do this, man. I I honestly can't think of a healthy way to do this because you're going to need to eat more food, which means you're going to be like eating many more calories in a day than you need because you're going to be staying up longer than you need. You're going to be needing to use caffeine at night, uh, which is very unhealthy because it has a six hour half life. So you kind of want to load the, if you're, if you're going to train until 2 a.m., uh, you definitely can't drink caffeine at midnight because then you'll really screw your, your sleep up at 2 a.m. when you go to bed. Um, so you need to be drinking it at like 10 PM to like prepare for the midnight tiredness, but like, then it's not going to be as effective because it'll always be like one quarter gone already. Um, and you can't really drink more. So you're screwed there. You're going to need to like, 
you're going to need a carbo low. So most people need sugar at night to like make sure their blood glucose is high enough. Um, but like obviously then it's going to spike your insulin and make you tired. So you need to make sure that you moderate that a little bit, you know, like eat fruit or something like that. Um, maybe naps, maybe naps is a good way to tackle it, except naps don't have any effect on your general level of like sleep and recovery. They only have a little bit of effect on your uh, alertness. So you could, you could go with naps and getting back up. Uh, you could, you could switch around your sleep schedule completely. So you could like go to bed at 6 PM right after dinner uh, right after you finish everything, you know, you study, you play, whatever, and then you go to sleep and then you get up at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2. Get up at 2 a.m. You could train from 2 a.m. till your day starts. Flip your schedule. Do what TSM Vist does. You know, he does his whole day, goes to bed, gets up at 2 a.m. and streams and kicks off his day. And then, his, you know, he finishes his work and then he goes along with the rest of his day after that uh, when 8 a.m. comes around. That honestly might be the best way to tackle this, that it's good for your body and healthy. Depending on how long you can sleep after you train, but if you want the training to come first and be fresh, then you're going to have to do the first in the day, which means you need to sleep beforehand. Oh, this talk about sleep made me yawn. Okay. Uh, wish I had a better answer for you. I need to know a little bit more about your schedule. Like, do you do you train you know close to midnight or do, do you train close to 4 a.m.? And can you flip it or not and train like after you wake up and can you go to bed like super early? Um, but there are people that do that and the, that's probably the, the healthiest thing on your bo- thing on your body is to go to sleep early, get up early. Just remember the mantra, early to bed, early to rise, makes you healthy, happy, and wise. Healthy, wealthy, and wise. Healthy, wealthy, and wise. There you go. All right, good luck. And I hope that you figure it out and... Uh, Maybe consider like an esport that that trains in the evening instead of um, at night. But you know, if Team Fortress Two is your jam, then I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say absolutely you have to stop. You know, you, you, there is a way to figure it out, uh, and it could just be you have to hedge your dreams, right? That you have this other stuff that you want to do, and therefore, because you have this other stuff that's important to you and that you have to do, you're never going to be as successful as you want to be, and that's just life because you value these things and you value you know, maybe you value your school, you value your sleep, you value your health, you value what your parents think about you, you value your grades, whatever it is, like you value it more than you value your competitive success. And that's a good thing um, to to live out your life according to your values. So if that's the case, then don't worry so much about your success in, in competitive Team Fortress 2 and instead focus on doing it as well as you can given the circumstances of your own priorities and accept that is the the end. Okay. Um, that's the show for you today. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And I will see you guys tomorrow.